the now the speaker is Damia Torres Latore, Latore. Okay, I guess, and uh, the title "Optimal Reality for Supercritical Parabolic Obstacle Problems." Yeah, welcome. Okay, so first of all, thanks for the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about my work here. So this talk will be about a paper which has the same title as the talk, which was put on the archive last year. And this is a joint work with my PhD advisor, Xavier Rosaton, and has been funded by our European research project, which is here. Okay, so the objective of the talk is to present some new results in this problem, and also for you to know the problem and to understand what do these words meaning. So through the talk, I will try to convey what is optimal regularity, what is supercritical, what is parabolic, and what is obstacle problem. Okay, first, I want to start with a motivation given by finances and probability, which is the optimal stopping problem. So in an optimal stopping problem, you have a random process and you have to choose when to stop. And you typically want to maximize the profit. So for example, if you have a stock, let's say, you can decide to sell it or you can decide to wait and do the, the market do its thing. So there are circumstances, assuming you have ideal information, where it's more profitable to sell. And there are other circumstances when it's more profitable to wait so the stock goes up, at least in expected value. So we can model this by saying that if we represent the state of the market as X and the time as T, there will be some PDE that we don't know yet the structure represented by this DTV is equal to LV. In the case that V is strictly greater than phi, or if I want to sell now, I sell at the price that I have now. Okay, so this PDE here is written for American options, which is a bit more complicated. So here you don't have the stock. What you have instead is a contract that says when time is equal to T, I will be able to sell at price phi. I have like pre-booked that right. And then if I sell before that, I can sell at the price that the market says. So of course, I will not sell if the market is below phi. So it only makes sense to consider the evolution of the market when you're above. And this is why there's a minimum here. And this can be written also as this PDE if V is strictly greater than phi or V is equal to phi. And what we want to understand is what is the set where you have to sell now and what is the set where you have to wait. And in particular, the geometry of the boundary that separates these two sets. Okay, for mathematical convenience, I prefer to have an initial condition at t equals zero that at the end of my process, so we do a change of variables. And this L here, you have to think of the minus the Laplacian. So the sign convention here is that this equation is a heat equation, is a parabolic equation. Okay, now, for which operator are we going to study this process? So this process, if we put the minus Laplacian, we get the fractional, uh, we get the parabolic obstacle problem which is closely related to phase transitions in solid liquid transitions in physics. But if we put a pure jump symmetric levy process, which is more appropriate when we are talking about the stock market, then what we get is something that closely resembles the heat equation, but has an unlocal behavior. Because here, instead of taking derivatives of u, we are considering u in the whole space. And then there's a contribution of this kernel that says if we are looking closer to the point or the tails are fatter, depending on S. But in any case, there's an unlocal contribution because the value of L of U in a point depends on the value of U in all the space. So if this K of Z is equal to a constant over Z to the and plus 2s, we recover the fractional Laplacian of order s. 
If this is not constant, then we have a bit of wiggle room. This is akin to non-divergence form elliptic operators of second order. And this is the operators that we are studying, which of course include the case of the fractional Laplacian. Okay, so this is a free boundary problem. Free boundary problem means there are two questions in regularity theory. First one is what is the regularity of the solution? Second one is what I said before. I have a set where the, my solution is equal to phi, have another set when my solution is bigger than phi and solution solves a PDE outside of the set where it's like touching phi. This is called the obstacle problem because you have to imagine that I have a solution U that is placed above an obstacle phi and it can like lie over the obstacle, which is called contact set because the solution coincides with the obstacle or it can be strictly above and then the solution needs to behave like the solution of a PE. Okay, now let's talk about some of the precedence to studying the supercritical parabolic obstacle problem. Let's start with the parabolic obstacle problem. So the parabolic obstacle problem is this one. When we put the Brownian motion as the stochastic process, when we put minus the Laplacian as our operator. It is a classical problem in free boundary theory, has been studied since the 70s. The big results from the 70s are these two ones that said the free boundary, the boundary of the set u equal phi is C infinity at regular points, which comes from combining these two results. And regular points are those points where the contact set has positive density. So you have to imagine here, all of those would be regular points. And the points that are not regular is for example, if from here, it starts like a line, like a spike, at the end of the spike, the contact set has zero density. So there we cannot talk about regularity. But if we are at a like normal point of the boundary where there is contact set at one side and non-contact set at the other side, then the boundary is infinity. Okay. This problem has been further studied in the elliptic case where you remove the time derivative as well by many authors. There are many results about generic regularity, structure of the singular points, less restrictive hypotheses on U and phi, et cetera. Okay. Now, this is the parabolic obstacle problem, parabolic because it has a heat equation. What about the non-local or fractional obstacle problem with the minus Laplacian to the S? So this problem has been studied much more recently. Started with 2006, 2007, people started studying this operator because they discovered, well, rediscovered because this is, was known from some people in probability, but the PD community discovered the extension formula, meaning that we have an unlocal operator here described by a singular integral, which is a very, very complicated, but we can write this equation as a local equation in Rm plus one. And then, I mean, a local equation, I mean an equation with a second order derivative, second order elliptic operator, which has some coefficients that depend on the position. And then there's an equivalence between this operator and a local operator. And we, via this local operator, many things can be proved about this. In particular, about the obstacle problem here, what they proved was that the optimal regularity of the solution is C1S. And then the free boundary can be divided into two sets. Now, instead of having the density of the contact set, we have the growth of the function as the characteristic that differentiates the free boundary points. If the growth of the function is what corresponds to the optimal regularity, then the free boundary at this point is C1 alpha as a manifold locally. And if the growth of the function is less than what should correspond to this optimal regularity, then we have degenerate points 
And in these degenerate points, basically we don't know much about what the free boundary looks like. And in this proof, it's critical to use the extension formula, which is what I told you before that this can be passed to a local problem in RM plus one. And this is why this proof only works for the fractional Laplacian and not for operators such as what I introduced at the beginning of the talk. It is worth mentioning that then Caffrelli, uh, Rosaton, and Serra proved something similar, but losing an epsilon here. For the elliptic case, when you put here a general non-local operator instead of the fractional Laplacian, some years later. Okay, now about the parabolic fractional problem. First results were in 2013 by Caffrelli and Figali that recover the same regularity of solutions in X as in the elliptic case, which makes you expect that it's optimal. And then in time, they get this other regularity, which is C1 beta. And beta depends on S in some way that makes sense for the scaling of the equation. So you have to notice here that I have a time derivative in U and I have an operator that is like two S derivatives in space to U. So if I rescale U, the only way to make sense of the equation is that the scaling of time and the scaling of space are related by a power of 2s. So it is natural to expect that the regularity in x and the regularity in t are different because they obey to different scalings. So this beta, if beta was equal to this, then it would be like the appropriate beta for the scaling. But in the proof, there is a point where they lose some regularity. They cannot achieve the optimal expected regularity, which would be C1s in x and C1 beta with beta equal to this thing in time. Now, I say was expected to be optimal because it turns out that it wasn't really optimal in some cases. Okay, and even more, this is only about the regularity of the solutions. Nothing is known about the regularity of the free boundary. And this proof uses very strongly the connection of this operator with a local operator when you use the extension property of Caffarelli Salsa Silvestre. So this is not extrapolable to general pure jump levy operators, at least not a big part of it. And then the main difficulty is that Normally, when you do this kind of stuff, in the local case, you use Almgren's monotonicity formula, which is a formula that comes from minimal surfaces, gives you very nice properties. And in a parabolic setting, you cannot really use that. But what they do is they adapt the elliptic formula, they use it for each t and treat the time derivative as an error term. And they somehow get rid of it at the end and then combine all the regularity given for each time slice to get like global regularity. Now, next step in the parabolic fractional problem was for the subcritical case. So now it's time to say what is supercritical and what is subcritical. So subcritical is S bigger than one half. Supercritical is S less than one half. What does this mean? If you see this equation, here, if S is bigger than one half, the higher order derivative is here in the minus Laplacian to the S because this has two S derivatives. And the local case is when S is equal to one. So this has two derivatives and this has one derivative. So scale in space goes faster than in time in a sense, which means that when you zoom in, you get closer to the elliptic problem then S equal one half is called the critical exponent because these two have the same order of derivative and then the situation becomes very delicate because there's a competition between the two terms. And then if S is less than one half, you have one derivative here and less than one derivative here. So what you get is a weird equation in a sense because you have diffusion and you have like transport in time in a sense, but diffusion is lower order. 
So these, in principle, would make things more complicated to get regularity. And this is called the supercritical. So for the subcritical case, we get something that is very similar to the elliptic problems. We get a dichotomy. We have regular points where the growth is like distance to the one plus s, which corresponds to the optimal regularity in space. And then we get points that are degenerate, but here instead of R squared, we have R2 minus epsilon. And moreover, the free boundary in these points is C1 alpha, and is an open subset of the whole boundary. And furthermore, at each free boundary point in the regular set, we can do an expansion, which is, if you subscribe to the obstacle, what remains is a linear function only to the one side of the free boundary to the power one plus s. And then the next term is one plus s plus alpha. So in a sense, what we're saying is that the free boundary is closer to a hyperplane at this point, and the growth of the function is one plus s, but uniformly in the, uh, in the direction perpendicular to this hyperplane, which is a result that is common among different free boundary problems. Now. What did we do? We studied the other case. We studied the supercritical case. So in the supercritical case, surprisingly, the optimal regularity that, that we get is not C1s, is more, is C11, index and in time. And the intuition behind this is a bit complicated, but what I want to say is that since this is less than, two, than one derivative, because 2s is less than one here, if you have regularity in time, you can pass the DTU to the other side of the equation and you get something like LU equals minus DTU. And then if the function is, for example, Lipschitz in time, automatically LU is in L infinity and then you get that U is somehow like C2S in X. So you have gain derivatives by using that this has less than one derivative and this has exactly one derivative, which is something that is not available in general when you are dealing with the S bigger than one half. On the other side, most of the techniques that are used for S bigger than one half don't work here. So you have to rely very heavily on gaining derivatives using that the order of derivation of these two operators is different. And now the fact that U is equal to the obstacle at the, Initial condition is key to discard stationary solutions, which are solutions of the elliptic problem, which are only C1s. So here we can get C11 because we are imposing that this is moving in a sense. This is not u equal phi for all t. And this is also not a solution of the elliptic problem. And then we also have to discard traveling wave solutions, which they exist, but they don't respect this initial condition. And also another comment is that the C11 norm blows up as t goes to zero and as t goes to infinity. Because as t goes to infinity, you converge to a solution of the elliptic problem, which is only C1s, and as t goes to zero, the estimates break, depending on the initial condition. But in general, it's not true. Now, moreover, from this optimal regularity, we are able to recover the free boundary regularity and an expansion. This is not typical in a free boundary problem. Typically, you have to do like more work, but here from the C11 regularity, we can, uh, without a lot of work, get that the derivatives of the function at the free boundary point are held continuous, all of them, and then we can recover that the free boundary is C1 alpha. And this C1 alpha is global. It's not at the regular point. It's at all points. And also we have this non-degeneracy that says, we know that the function is C11, but the function is C11 at all free boundary points. And it cannot be like better than C11 because we have this quadratic term that is only at one side of the free boundary. So now there are no regular points and singular points in the previous sense, but we can define a singular point, which is a point where the free boundary disappears as you advance in time. 
because here the hyperplane that separates the contact set with the set where the U is solving the PVE, this is also always advancing in time and it has certain slope in X. But if A is zero, what you get is something like C T minus T zero square plus, plus a lower error term. So what you get at point where A is zero is that the free boundary disappears in a sense, that the function starts behaving like T squared. And what we call, what we know about these points is that the points with A zero, which we call singular points in this problem, have zero measure for almost every T. So in general, we don't expect to see much of them. And something that I didn't write, but it's worth commenting is if A is different from zero, just by the implicit function theorem, we know that the free boundary is a C1 alpha graph in each time slice. I mean, if you fix T as a constant, what you get is that the free boundary is a C1 alpha graph, the free boundary of U dot T. Okay. And in singular points, you cannot do that because the free boundary is disappearing. So you can get whatever set. And that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, questions? Uh, okay, uh, Demir, uh, uh, is uh, anything uh, known about just critical case? Uh, S equal one half. Yes, but they are working on it. I, as far as I know, like Rosaton, Serra, Figali, and they had something, but they are working on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Damia, and what is your just recall? What is your what is your requirements for the regularity of obstacle for functions? Uh, the obstacle is assumed to be C to one. I think oh, wow. it's just so that you can get semi-convexity of the solution at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Then for the other part, I think C11 is enough. Okay, thank you. I also would like to ask, I'm Roberta Monzina, if it has a sense, it, it might have a sense to consider problems on bounded domains. Uh, how, how, how do you mean? Uh, for instance, um, for the restricted Dirichlet Laplacian or some spectral Laplacian with Dirichlet boundary conditions in a given bounded domain. Yes, th so. that's actually a very good question because the fact that we don't study fractional problems in bounded domains is basically because we don't know how. Because at the beginning of everything, to get Lipschitz regularity of the solution, what you do is you do a trick, which is translate the solution, lift it a bit, and then by the comparison principle, you get Lipschitz regularity. But you can only do that in the whole space. So if you look at this paper is in the whole space, this paper is in the whole space for the subcritical case. This is also in the whole space for the regularity of the solutions. Even the elliptic case is in the whole space. There is a very recent paper by Cabré, where they, and I don't know the other people, when they show Lipschitz regularity of U without use in a bounded domain. And it could be interesting to look at that and see what can we reconstruct from there. But for a general non-local operator, we don't know how to do it yet. Okay, thank you. It's the time for the next speaker. Uh, okay, uh, maybe one question more, if, if you please. Uh, uh, Damia, and uh, could you, uh, uh, did you try to make uh, financial operations uh, using your theory? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.